Travis Show. Tonight, Dick's guests are directors Robert Altman, Peter Bogdanovich, Mel Brooks, Frank Capra, and Bob Rosengarten and the orchestra. Ladies and gentlemen, Dick Cavett. Why did I come over here? You like me. Oh. <laughs> See, last night, one of the cameramen was on a great deal because I learned how to use the camera the night before last, I mean. And so the other cameraman, I feel, must feel a little uh, jealous. Don't you? You want to do it again? No, I don't remember anything that I learned. This, of course, is one of our best cameramen. His name is... Uh... Henry. Henry. And he, uh, he works here. <laughs> You know, if I seem to be killing time, it's because I don't have anything planned for the beginning. Uh, I, I ran out of funny stuff. For, this is the fifth show of the week, and I used it all on the four shows. <laughs> so the only thing I thought of I might do is surprise to the technicians. For you, you may know that I have worn this microphone that has bothered me for so long because I have to wear a big pack here that has the transmitter in it. But it, the advantage of it is that it will work anywhere I go in the theater, I was told. And one night I ran into the balcony, and it didn't work. I'm gonna check it and see if it'll work. Can I just check it? Is it working? It is? Okay. Take a break. No. Is, it, is, it, is it on? Is it working? Okay. I just had to find out. Why do I look like Boris Karloff up here? Right? <laughs> Can't we like these people better than that? Look, we... Uh, I, now I have to go back. I have a job down there. What are you ladies doing in here? It's a whole group of, of ladies. Listen, we have an interesting show now because we have all film directors and so many people are... A lot of kids are only staying in college because there are film courses, which may or may not be fortunate. But uh, since there's so much to talk to these four men about, I will be back downstairs in a moment, but first, someone in your family have a sore throat? Here's a reminder. Can you read that off for me, why the sore throat season? Calls for Aspergum, of course. We'll be right back. My first guest is a man who directed MASH, and Brewster McLeod and McCabe and Mrs. Miller, and he's also the man who once said an interesting thing. He said, no one has ever made a good movie. That, should be, that could be the theme of our conversation tonight. I think maybe he's being too modest. But here's a clip from MASH, M-A-S-H. And uh, after that, we will meet Robert Altman. Take a look at this. Captain Peterson! Be up and uh. What are you two hoodlums doing in this hospital? Ma'am, we are surgeons, and we are here to operate. We're just waiting for a starting time. That's well, you all. can't even go near a patient until Colonel Merrill says it's OK. And he's still out to lunch. Look, Mother, I want to go to work in one hour. We are the pros from Dover, and we figure to crack this kid's chest and get out to the golf course before it gets dark. So you go find the gas passer, and you have him premedicate this patient. Then bring me the latest pictures on him. The ones we saw must be 48 hours old by now. Then call the kitchen and have them rustle us up some lunch. Ham and eggs will be all right. Steak would be even better. And give me at least one nerd who knows how to work in close without getting her tits in my way. How do you want your steak cooked? We welcome the director of that film, Robert Altman.
Does it seem odd to see a little bit of the movie after this long, uh, like that? Does it? Yeah, the last time I saw it was here, I think. <laughs> we we'll showed some of that before. No, Maybe no. even this, that same part. <coughs> what, what does it feel like when you see a film a year later? Do you have a critical eye for things you might have done over? Well, it, uh, it's embarrassing, but I, I like it. You like it? Yeah, yeah, it's surprising. You know that when Orson Welles was here, he would not, he honestly backstage would not look at his clips when they were on the screen. He just, well, embarrassing he's, for he's him. He's more something. sensible than I am because I still like what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Say, who was that actor who was so brilliant in McCabe and Mrs. Miller? And he was the, um, the big tall man at the end, the marksman. Oh, Hugh Millay. He's, yeah, uh, gee. That was, he's never acted before. That was his first. That's funny, because I thought his name sounded familiar. I watched The Crawl, and then I forgot the name. He's never acted. His grandfather yet. was a painter. Yeah. But uh, he just, um, I just used him in, in a very uh, much larger role in the film I just finished. Now, how can you take a guy who hasn't acted and know that it's not going to be a, a disaster? Well, he's not expensive. So yeah. uh, the replacement is easy, and uh, mm -hmm. he, uh, I, I just felt that, that, well, basically, Hugh is a sort of a con man anyway, so he's been acting all his life, and it was yeah. very easy. He did exactly the same thing that he does. Yeah, he's so good at it. Um, what do you mean by this mysterious quote that nobody, um, well, it was in an article, <clears throat> wasn't it? You said about I, nobody can ever made, has ever made a good movie. No, I, what I said was that I feel that the, the medium of film has yeah. not yet really been explored. In other words, I think that when we started uh, a film, we took it from theater, literature, and we were an extension of, of another art form. And uh, it's still that way, it's getting away from it. And I think that eventually somebody will make a film that is purely a film and the audience can respond to as such. And okay. I don't think it's been done. How could it not have anything to do with anything else? I mean, it has to have dialogue, doesn't it? And it has to have... Well, no. Uh, well, I think it's, well, they uh, didn't for a long time, did <laughs> yeah, they? See, Come to think of it. I think it's like a, a, a painting, an experience. It's got... The only limitations are the, the linear ones. It has length. It has its beginning and an mm. end. It takes a certain amount of time. Yeah. But uh, the, I think that ideally the audience can look at a film emotionally get the whole thing and uh, not necessarily be able to explain it to somebody else. They say, hey, how'd you yeah. like the picture? I liked it. Should I they mean, be able to tell what it means? Yeah, to them. I think they should, to, to themselves, they should mm. feel and know what it means. And it's, it happens in, in sections of films that uh, you see today. You, you, you get an impression. Yeah. And you know what it means, but you can't articulate it. <clears throat> you must have... Um you must make script writers furious because you will let the actors improvise things, make up things, and you'll shoot even rehearsals sometimes, don't you? Or was it, is that true that you shot some rehearsals for MASH? Well, we, we, MASH, was, we had to, but we, yeah. uh, I mean, the whole picture was getting out of hand. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the, um, the, the film I just finished was, was my own screenplay, and I must say to any writers out there that I treated mine worse than I did any of yours. <laughs> Treated yours what? My own screenplay. Your own, or your own yeah. script, I see. But yeah. it, it's not, I, I don't consider that we're misusing yeah. the screenplay. We use it as a, it's a guide, and it's, I'm trying to imp just bring the impression, the, the behavior that the yeah. author intended, or that, that we all intended, to uh, the best way possible. Do you have any idea why we're so different? I'm thinking of one certain thing I know about you, and that is, the, uh, to look at you, you look like maybe a quiet, conservative businessman, but, uh, but you can get drunk and stay out all night and a couple of nights and then go right to work. And I, I've heard this anyway, I don't know if it's true. If I did that, I would be rolled in flat on my face to work and I would have to have a transfusion and sent home. Well, I... I or have I, no, I, I misrepresented uh, I, you? <laughs> no, I, I sometimes don't sleep as much as I should. Yeah. But I'm afraid of the dark and, and uh, I... I'm worried that I can't really do what I have to do the next day. So I stay awake and ignore it. Is that what it is? You'll stay up because you don't want to have the, the horrible the that come with going to sleep? I think so. Yeah. Gee. I, I really look at a film and I think there's no way to do this tomorrow. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then after I see a film, I say, how, how did they do that? I don't know how it gets done. Yeah. Do you have any heroes in among the filmmakers? Oh, a lot. I think yeah. the... the uh, Primarily the, the early uh, f filmmakers in Hollywood who, you know, I'm always asked, uh, being a, a late arrival to 
the yeah. critics and things. I'm always asked, uh, what, who are your favorite, who influenced you and, and what directors influenced you? And the truth of it is, I probably don't know their names because I was very mm -hmm. influenced when I was very young by films, but I didn't know there was a director. It's strange to think there was an age when people didn't go to movies because of a certain director, but because of who's in the movies. Yeah. And, yeah. Now, so, now directors are stars in a very odd way, which may not be good. Maybe we can talk very about that odd some stars. more. Let's take, let's take a little uh, march through time with Bird's Eye Frozen Orange Plus, and we'll be back. I thought we'd get everybody out relatively early, and then we can all talk. Uh, my next guest has won Oscars for a short called The Critic and his funny movie, The Producers. Mel Brooks has always been known as one of the funniest people around. No one ever thought anyone would ever trust him with making a movie. <laughs> he was one of the creators of TV's Get Smart. He started in a very funny movie of his own called Twelve Chairs. And now he's, uh, well, if he never did anything but the uh, incredible 2,000-year-old man, he would be justly famous. But anyway, uh, let's take a look at um, this scene from the producers, which if you haven't seen the film will probably upset you in some ways and make you laugh in others. And until you know what it's all about, it must be astounding to just see it like this. Will you uh, take a look at the scene from Mel Brooks, uh, the producers? Good evening, ladies and germs, and welcome to a Bang Up Variety Show presented by four boys here at the Big DC Show. <laughs> oh, no. We have a swell high-class show tonight, strictly loads of talent, lots of laughs, and I'm going to be your compere. That's French for MC, that's initials for metal case, but I want to tell you... <laughs> As you see, Mr. Brooks is just one of the everyday people. Uh, how, how can you come out and do that? First of all, I always feel when that clip was shown once before, it's, it's been seen on television before, there are always a lot of people who... <laughs> who, uh, who, everybody, who, who get all upset about Everybody got coffee in the green room but me. Yeah. So I want my coffee. <laughs> Look at the spoons they have. Oh, beautiful. And so, and so I always feel that seeing the scene out of context is very difficult. Are you going to drink coffee right here now? <laughs> A little, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, out of context, out of do, context. Yeah, yes, out of context. Good. Do, do, are good there beginning. other people who won't? Good. Do, are there, I think... <laughs> We ought to get George I, uh, and Bill, and we ought to have a meeting, yeah. because everything is out of context. There was no reason for Lieutenant Merrick to uh, take command of the cane, as far as I could see. We, uh, we were, uh, you just ask questions, and I'll answer them to the best of my ability. How, uh, how did you get people to give you the money to do a movie? When you walk in like this, and I don't know. That, that's that an picture. astonishing thing. I, that uh, picture cost about a million bucks. Yeah. And, uh... And in case anyone didn't get it, that was supposed to be, that musical was supposed to represent the worst possible taste in a musical, according to yeah. the plot. We don't need to go into yeah. any further Well, they that. were trying to put on a flop, and, I, and, mm -hmm. and it backfired, because the, 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 the Jews didn't believe it. Yeah. They couldn't believe that anything like that would be quite portrayed on them. Again, 
Yeah. So they assumed it was funny, and it was a big hit. And that caused a lot of trouble for our protagonist, Bialystok yeah. and Bloom, the, the, the leading characters in, in the film. Yes, film, film. film. Yeah. What were you doing when that, that fertile idea was born in your nimble brain? <laughs> what do you mean, was I wrote it. When it I know, but I mean, you must have sat down and thought, I don't have an idea for a movie yet, and then there was another moment where you did have a moment for a movie, an idea I for I was doing... I was, blah, 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 blah. I was doing a show, mm -hmm. and uh, the producer of the show, Broadway show, said, uh, look, uh, they, they, they want a release, so what are, you, what are we doing next? What are we doing next? Uh, what, what, give me a title. Mm -hmm. I said, we're doing a musical called Springtime for Hitler. Tell them that. <laughs> he said, I, I, can't, I can't tell them that. I said, you tell them that. We're doing Springtime for Hitler. Mm -hmm. So Ed Padula was the producer. He was a little worried. He said, okay. Yeah. He said, we're doing Springtime for Hitler next. And they said, who's in it? They said, well, well, we're not sure. You know, we just... <laughs> we're we right gave, past them, eh? We just gave them the title, you know. Yeah. And then about a year later, I said, what a wonderful title. Yeah. Springtime for Hitler. Now, if I can uh, get some idea underneath that, you know, a story or something, mm -hmm. I would be very happy. So I thought, I said, well, let me see, Springtime for Hitler, if it is a show, it's probably the worst show ever in the worst possible taste. And I worked back from that. Yeah. And I thought of uh, a Broadway producer, and then I, I thought of a, you know, the Gene Wilder character, Leo Bloom, and, and from there on it was uh, fun and yeah. easy. Yeah. Is any of your own life in the movie? Oh, all of it. All of it. <laughs> all of it. it is really autobiographical. Yeah, I see. Because I was with them. I was. No. Be crushed, France, 27 days, you know, France. Poland a half hour. <laughs> no more Poland. You know, very convincing. Whatever we that. want, we take. We now in Argentina, all of us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is it true that you oh, receive yeah. these stolen paintings they take from museums, that they go into your collections and... I will not speak unless Herr von Ribbentrop is on my right to protect me from the vileness of your young goy. Wait. <laughs> wrong. Wrong. Uh, would you like a piece of goat cheese? Goat cheese? How so? How so? so uh... Uh, I have a piece for you. I'd like... Where, where is it? It's right here. Is it really goat cheese? Yeah, it's really good. Did you want to split it? It was in my lunch, and I know how you like goat cheese, and I... I'll have a little bit. I brought that for you. Hmm. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? It's feta no, why, cheese. Wh it's what? Feta, feta, F-E-T-A, Greek cheese, goat cheese. Did they have that in Yugoslavia when you were making your film? Wood. There? We ate wood. <laughs> That's the, I had nothing. I see. <laughs> there was nothing to do at night. There was no fun. Tito yeah. had the car. <laughs> Okay, we will be right back after this message from our local station. <whistles> Try and conduct yourself with a little deportment. Oh, well, he's the conductor. Why don't you talk to him? <laughs> <laughs> I must get right into this because of, we're going to lose our film machine in a moment. My, my next guest is a young director whose second film, uh, The Last Picture Show, has been an enormous success. Uh, all his life he has wanted to make movies, and he did. He knows just about everything there is to know about movies from being a film historian, a critic, all kinds of things. Um, anyway, the piece of film you're about to see is from that movie, The Last Picture Show, and um, then we will welcome him, but let's take a look at that first. Hey, why don't you take care of the car for me? Don't your mom don't need it? I wouldn't want her driving it. No better than she can drive. You might help her take the groceries home, you got the time. Okay. Jaycee? No, not a thing. She don't get home much. Ain't been back town since August. I guess she just stays in Dallas all the time. Yeah, it probably does. Well, I guess there's a lot to do down in Dallas. I ain't over yet, you know. Same. We welcome director and movie fanatic Peter Bogdanovich. Thank you. 
Well, are you going to stay in the movie business, or are you thinking of changing professions? I want to run a late-night talk show. <laughs> oh, you're, you're never satisfied, no. are you? You know, uh, I guess um, if anybody ever got to do what they really want, always wanted to do, it's you making pictures. Uh, are these rumors true that you've spent probably 80% of your life either seeing movies, reading about them, writing about them, or cutting them up, or something? Not cutting them up. I never cut a picture till I did one, you know. Your own. Yeah, yeah. but uh, seeing them, yeah. yeah. And writing about them a little bit, but seeing them a lot. They also have, there's a number of myths about you already, even though you're very young, like the fact that you had a goal set for yourself that you would make a movie at the same age Orson Welles did. Oh, I wanted to, I thought I'd be a failure if I didn't make a movie at least by the time or, I was 25, which is when Orson made Citizen Kane, and I was a disaster because I didn't make one until I was 27. Yeah. So yeah. I thought I was a real flop. How did you ever convince anybody to make the film in black and white? I, for years, have wanted to see a movie in black and white, and I don't think there's been one since. And you still uh, haven't. That's right, I haven't seen your film. <laughs> I was supposed to see it before you got here tonight, and I couldn't. And I, now I will see it after you get here, and you can come back and ask me how I how you liked, liked it, it if I've seen white. it. Yeah. yeah. It's a good picture. It's uh, all right? Yeah. It's good? It's oh, okay. What a relief. You'll like it. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, black and white, it, it, every, uh, people ask me that, and, and it, I wish I had a great story to tell, but, but it was so simple that it was embarrassing. I just said to the producers, gee, I'd like to shoot this in black and white, because... Uh, we took some test footage of all the towns in Texas, mm -hmm. these dreary, sad towns, and we shot them in color, the tests, you know? I shot them with a 16 millimeter can. They all look pretty, because yeah. color does that, you know? So I, uh, we ran them for the producer. I said, this isn't what we want, is it? And they said, no. I said, well, well, let's shoot it in black and white. And they said, oh, you want to shoot it in black and white? I said, yeah. OK. So they, talked to the, they went and talked to Columbia, and Columbia evidently didn't have any objection. And, uh, uh, maybe they did, but I never heard about it. And they came back to me and said, okay. And then I got nervous. Because I said, you agreed. sure you want to do it in black and white? Yeah, yeah it was just really that, that they, simple. that no one would dare make a movie in black and white because it would kill the television resale. Well, well John really Schlesinger told me that he wanted to make Sunday Bloody Sunday in black and white, and they wouldn't let him, so it is true. Mm -hmm. But I just was lucky he had good producers. But I can't believe people are still that fascinated with color that they just go to the movies to see color move around on the screen. I don't right? think so. And the, and the last picture show is successful at the box office. Yeah. And so uh, it disproves that yeah. theory. Would you have the nerve, Mel, to have asked to make a movie in black and white? <laughs> for colorblind people. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think, no, I think that uh, black and, really seriously, making a picture in black and white could be an arty trick, you know, just just yeah. a, just a kind of a gimmick, yeah. but unless it's truly indigenous to to the uh, locale and the theme and you know mm -hmm. the story, and and uh, it is indeed uh, proper. It is proper, you know, yeah. in in the last. I don't picture think show. every picture should be in black and white. You know, I think color is wonderful, and I just did a picture now in color, so I'm not always doing in black. Yeah. I was on a I was on a plane with Garson Kanan, and we were taking off, and there was this beautiful sunset. And we looked out, and he says, look at that. And I said, yeah, it's beautiful. He says, I suppose you see it in black and white. <laughs> <laughs> you, you should have zapped him for that. We, let's take a station break. We'll be right back. <laughs> Mr. Brooks has been treating the studio audience to a little musicale during the, during the break. Uh, I was marvelous, I thought. <laughs> you were, yes. Yeah. So much of you is wasted by just simply directing movies and things. Yes, and I and I do. I am a very good dancer, very good ballroom, very good yeah. ballroom dancer. You did a dancer. very good Bogart, which is very right, tough. Your Bogart yeah. is good. Your, your ballroom, everything that starts with B, you do well. Yes, yes. <laughs> the way ahead. Okay, okay. okay. Frank Capra no. won an Oscar in. He didn't win an Oscar in 1934. Didn't it happen one night when five? five or, yeah, at least I was going to say five, five Oscars for every, the five top Oscars, I suppose, that year for maybe the most successful comedy ever put on film. Uh, both stars in the film won Oscars, and um, you wouldn't have any trouble identifying them, I don't think, in the scene in which they have to pretend to be uh, man and wife. Want to take a look at that? Your name. Hey, wait a minute. That's my wife you're talking to. 
What do you mean, come here? What do you want, anyway? We're looking for somebody. Yeah, well, look your head off. Don't come busting in here. This isn't a public park. I can nurse to take a sock at you. Take it easy, son. Take it easy. As these men are detectives, Mr. Moore. I don't care if they're the whole police department. They can't come bust in here shooting questions of my wife. Now, don't get too excited, Peter. The man just asked you a civil question. Oh, is that so? Say, how many times have I told you to stop butting in when I'm having an argument? Well, you don't have to lose your temper. You don't have to lose your temper. One of the giants is the French chapter. Does that bring back any particular memories, or does it all blur? Well, uh, no. It, it, that, the, that's a wonderful scene. I think we could, between the, those two, those two people, they were, they were just made for the. That, that particular part, yeah. those particular parts. And were Clark they... Gable, the, the, that's the real Clark Gable. Very few people have ever seen him, but that's the way he really was in life, you see. Well, uh, in, as, as he was in that film, or as he was just in that scene? As he was in that, well, this light, oh. light comic. Yeah, know? yeah. And that's the way he was, and that's the way he was not in many other pictures. And it's too bad. It's, uh, yeah. The real Clark Gable, I think, is just... Did he worry about mm. things like that, like whether a film was right for him or not? No, he should do it or no, not, he didn't. He, uh, he actually, he actually thought every day was his last. You know, he thought he said, "It's just, this, this can't go on." You know, this, this has got to end. Uh, mm -hmm. this, hap this happy Cinderella story. He thought he was. He didn't think he was a very good actor. And I have a feeling he's one of those men who always thought it was a kind of odd profession for a man to be in. Probably. Well, that well he was a stage actor, so but he didn't mm -hmm. think he was very good at, ever. And uh, he certainly didn't, didn't didn't think he was a star. It wasn't. It was going to end. Yeah. yeah. Right. It became one of, the, of course one of our greatest. Yeah. And is it true that Claudette <clears throat> Colbert was not supposed to originally play that part? Is it? Uh, no, but uh, we had four or five girls turn the part down. That, that's turn it down. quite a long story about everybody turning it down. Yeah. Bring the part down. And we only got her because she was on vacation. And we, we, uh, we offered her twice as much money for four weeks. And mm -hmm. we finished her with her in four weeks. And she didn't, after the, after the show was over, she thought it was one of the worst pictures she ever made. So it, it was all. <laughs> Never trust actors. The story of this picture is really opinions, fantastic. Yeah. Can I just ask you one little silly, trivial question before we take a break here? Um, how did you make it look so convincingly cold? in Lost Horizon. I know people who saw that movie watched it with, uh, with their coats on in some cases. <laughs> and well, trying to, uh, being realistic was a fetish for me. I tried to, uh, to photograph things as they really were. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I was always trying to do was uh, show p people's best uh, showing when it was really cold. That's what was always missing in cold yeah, scenes. Yeah, and I and tried movies. it once with an actor uh, before and I almost killed the poor fellow. I, f I found out that if you I tried it with uh, a dry ice. I put dry ice in little cages, and I put the little cages in the actor's mouth. And it yeah. worked all right, all right, but they couldn't talk with it, you see. So, <laughs> so uh, this uh, Hobart Bosworth, mm -hmm. with the picture called um, uh, Dirigible, I put it in his mouth. We were supposed to be on the South Sea Islands, uh, South, sea, uh, South uh, Pole. South Pole. South Pole. And, and he was supposed to plant the flag on the South Pole mm -hmm. in the name of the United States. Well, he, put this thing in his mouth and this great big bird cage and he, and he couldn't talk with it and he said, in the name of you. Finally he got so uh, desperate he took the thing out and he says, you want, I can't talk with this thing, you want uh, coal, I'll give you coal. And he took the pill and put it in his mouth and uh, dry ice and he began to talk and suddenly he was on the ground groveling in absolute pain and we rushed him to a hospital and he lost his whole <laughs> three, uh, three teeth and part of his upper uh, 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 really? jaw yeah. just froze. From putting actual dry ice in his Yes, eyes. so I, yeah. this is what happened to one man, man where I tried to get the breast jaw, but that, not only get the lost her eyes, and I was I had to find some other way. Yeah. So I figured out. <laughs> so I would I think so. Out, well, why not shoot him where it's absolutely cold? Where, 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 where was it cold? A nice house. So I went to a nice house. Mm -hmm. Fish house. And uh, uh, here, uh, uh, here it was down in 15 degrees and loaded with fish, logs like, you know, and uh, so we, we uh, threw out the fish and brought in the actress, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> nice way of putting it. We, we have a message, we'll be right back. Revlon's Fabulash. Uh, hey, can we do so that it? together? I'll do it in harmony with you, talking harmony, okay? 
Of course. Here we go, from the top. All right? All right. You just Are you normal ready? Normal voice, and I'll be an octave above. What okay? key should we do this in? No, your normal voice. I'll pick it up. All, All right? right. Revlon's, Revlon's Fabulash can make a big change in your eyelashes. eyelashes. You'll see, see your, your lashes, lashes get longer, longer right, right before your eyes. eyes. <laughs> really? Very nice. Yeah. You have a strangely high voice. Yes. I'm called Mr. Harmony. I can harmonize with anything. I can harmonize with an animal. I can harmonize with a gentile. Any human. I do a lot of harmony. Did you start to say a yes, gentile? Yes, I can talk Because I'm you. easily offended. No, I, I don't want to offend you. <laughs> well, all right. God has heartily offended you by giving you short stature. And I am not going to contribute to that. <laughs> you know I make a joke. You're one of the best-looking short people I've ever met. Thank you very much. And the worst yes, host I've ever met. <laughs> I'm a stubby little dream, aren't I? <laughs> you broke me up. So is yourself. Listen, <laughs> now, now that we have everyone out here, um, let, let's pin one thing down for all time, and then maybe it'll never have to come up on a talk show again. And that is, is Hollywood dying, as we constantly hear, or is it not? Gentlemen? Well, I think Mr. Kaplan knows more about it. I, I've never, personally, I've never made, I've made two films. Uh, that makes me a director. I'm sitting here with other directors. <laughs> yeah. I made two pictures. So I really don't know anything about really making movies. Mm -hmm. Both my films were made um, outside of, you know, the Hollywood precincts. One yeah. was in New York, and the other one was, you, 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 you go, go, you go, go, sla, so sla, you go, sla, yeah, right. That's my home country, yeah. you know. I'm I'm take it easy. I'm sorry. Yes. Dobro, dobro. 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 Not only that, but John Simon, the film critic, comes Who? from there. John Simon? I don't know him. That may be his, that may be the problem. I, he's I mean, in my new movie, you know. How do you mean that? I mean that. An actor... And he's playing a part? No. No. no uh, John Simon uh, uh, is impersonated in my new movie by an actor that uh, Mel used in, in uh, The Producers named uh, Ken, Kenneth Mars. And what did he play in The Producers? Play Oh, well, I, there's no... He played the Nazi in the producers, <laughs> but... He, he, he was Franz Liebkin, the man with the helmet. Oh, yeah. Liebkin, love child. Franz Liebkin. Liebkin. Yes. But in, in, uh -huh. in What's Up, Doc, uh, Kenneth plays a, a fellow named Hugh Simon, who is mm -hmm. the heavy. That's very close to John Simon. A lot Isn't of people it? will guess. Yes, yeah. yeah. Does he know? I mean, does he... Uh, I don't think he knows now, but... <laughs> does this have anything to do with his saying on the show the other night that you had a misspent youth uh, living in cinema? No, I've always thought he was a very shoddy critic and one who didn't know anything about pictures. And so... Wait, wait, wait he's going to say good now. Long... <laughs> wait for the so, Valentine. Long time ago, he, he, uh, somebody sent me a book of his to review when I was... I used to be a critic, you know? Okay. And and they sent me and I reviewed it for the that's all right and for the I reviewed it for the Washington Post and I I had never read his stuff and they sent me this book it came to me cold and I read it it was a terrible book with all kinds of terrible mistakes in it I mean factual mistakes forget about the critical uh, errors in judgment which I didn't d deal with it was just mm -hmm. factual errors and I wrote this review and and uh, have always thought he's always been sort of a a pain you know and so and he's Wait, so there's no there's no good coming no. And there is no and good he's such a he's such a pompous poop, you know. That Look, it's getting, that, that's, that's the worse, good. Folks. <laughs> that's the good. So that was the compliment you were that, waiting for. That, that I I had this character in the movie, uh, this rival to Ryan O'Neill, and I thought, there's the character, you know, this kind of European uh, 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 pseudo intellectual, you know. And I sort of thought that'd be fun to have him play that. Well, I see. But do you like John Simon? I that's love the it. Part we're trying to get. <laughs> We got a little off the track. Um, oh, you asked if Hollywood we'll was We'll find dying. out if Hollywood... Let's find that out after this message. Oh. Okay, we'll be right back. <laughs> Mr. Capper, we all agreed during the break that with your list of stunning films, uh, we all like to hear you talk about whether you think Hollywood is a, is a dying business. Uh, That's been said many times before, that Hollywood has been a dying business. It's been said over and over, probably every 10 years or so, it get, gets said. Hollywood is down at the moment, yes. Down, perhaps unemployment is there. But uh, Hollywood is never going to. Uh, if Hollywood means anything to films, all I, all I can say is that films are not going to die, I tell you that. No, they're yeah. going to be made somewhere. If not in Hollywood, they're made someplace else. Mm. Uh, the films are the greatest of all art, art forms. It's an art form that, that comprises all the others, uses all the others as tools. Mm -hmm. It's probably the the only art form that's the new, the only art form that's been created in the last 
probably five or six thousand years or so. Uh, and, uh, and I agree with Bob Altman when he says the, the uh, good pictures are yet to be made. Mm -hmm. They are yet to be made because uh, we, haven't, we haven't really scratched the surface of this enormous tool that we have in our hands that uh, fill. So, so maybe Hollywood is dying as a geographical point, but films are not dying, and the uh, fil film art is not dying. The film art is just waiting for somebody to make some good films. That's all. Well, sometimes they say the old Hollywood is dead, and at least one, if it is, good, because a lot of those swine like Harry Cohn, who used to tyrannize people when he ran Columbia Studios and all, I'm sort of quoting people, uh, are no longer around, and at least that era is over. Well, I think we but miss... But he comes off very, rather appealingly in your book. I mean, you apparently knew how to deal with him, and you always hear of him as the worst rat who ever lived in Hollywood. Well, lived. he ran his studio on a very crad, uh, crass, uh, you know, crude uh, uh, method. If he, uh, if he could bully you, he didn't want you around. But if you could stand up to him, he wanted you, and he'd give you all the all the all the the the, the, the uh, control that you wanted to do your films. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, uh, he was a very very good thing for Hollywood, Harry Cohen. When you first met him, were you scared? Everybody's scared of Harry Cohen. Harry, he, he, said, he, he had such a reputation of being a monster, and he yeah. was. He was uh, he was all the dirty things everybody called him, yeah. but he was also a tremendous uh, catalyst for films. He loved films, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, I just think we could use several Harry Cohens right now in, in uh, Hollywood at the moment. I think we missed the Harry Cohens. Do you think Cohens. there was an advantage to the Cohen in the sense that at least it was one man running the studio instead of a, a, a bunch of cooks? A great advantage. He could make. He could say. He could, he could say yes or no. Once he said mm -hmm. yes, it was yes. You didn't. You, uh, you didn't have to bother with anybody else. But now you have to get a, uh, concessions from lawyers, from agents, and from. Uh, financing and from banks and from oil companies, all, uh, oil and companies and everything else. Yeah. Uh, people, non-creative people are yeah. running this Hollywood at the moment. And if we get back to uh, some creative people running Hollywood, we'll get back into the These, swim of uh, things. Uh, Cohen and, and uh, uh, Jack Warner, uh, who I never got along with, but at least, like you said, they love films mm -hmm. and they, they were monarchs and they didn't pass it on. But these clowns today, you know, they're in the hotel business, they're in the... They don't, they don't uh, have the... I wonder who you're talking about. I was talking about Jim Aubrey and Doug Netter. And <laughs> <laughs> people like we that. We missed some of the other names. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, that's what I always think they mean when Hollywood is dead. That you have to deal with these conglomerates, and how can a man make a film while he's waiting for a phone call to find out if the board of a sawdust <coughs> packaging yeah, company I likes the there script? Was some, there was a tradition. It was some kind of a tradition of, of uh, art and money you know, an amount mm -hmm. of art and money. But at least there was some tradition. I mean, I, 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 I despise uh, the, th the very thing that uh, you were talking about, what Peter was talking about, that um, Kinney parking lots are, you know, are, are making movies. And there, there really isn't any traditional Saul Urich or, well, you know, an L.B. Mayer or Jack Warner. Or, mm -hmm. I met Harry Cohn. I, I was brought out in 1952. I was doing the show of shows. And Freddie Comar, who produced a, a lot of wonderful pictures for Columbia, uh, brought me out and introduced me to Jerry Wald, who was running the studio at the time, a wonderful picture maker too, Jerry Wald, and uh, a writer and a very dynamic guy. And uh, I, uh, I went to a meeting. I didn't know where I was going. Uh, Jerry said, come, come on, we're, 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 Harry Cohen, the meeting. Meeting. Oh, good, I'm going to meeting. I love a meeting. Yeah. So I went down to the barber shop. <coughs> and Harry Cohen was in the, was in the barber chair. Straight out, straight. He was being shaven, straight out, yeah. flat out. And uh, there were about 20 executives, studio guys, sitting around the barber shop, and I sat next to Freddie Comer and Jerry Wald, you know. And the barber moved them around like mobile artillery. <laughs> like he'd Aiming say, at people? Yeah, he'd say, Joni Taps, wang, they'd swing them around, and Joni Taps would say, I didn't, I, I don't know why. <laughs> and so it didn't make money. You can't all make money. It was, uh, uh, we have a lot of black and white shoes, the things you like, Harry, and uh, with a lot of talk like that, see? And then he's uh, on the on one of the swings, he said, who's that kid? And I, I said, I'm not here. I didn't know what this. I said, I'm not here, Mr. Cohn. I'm, not I'm here. simply not here. And you know what? He said, good, and he, that's it. <laughs> he bought, I that boy. And yeah. one more story with him. When I was hired, uh, I, I don't know, I think Alfred Hayes, had my office before me, and I, when I came in, I saw they, they took his name out, out of the door, out, and they put my name in, and it scared me. 
zip zap a name, a person. I didn't want to open the door. I thought he's dead behind the door, you know? Yeah. And, and so I got crazy. And on that same day, the lunch hour, I went down. There was like a four-story building, Columbia, on Gower. And I changed all the names. Like, I took the names from the top floor. I slid them all out, and I put them on the bottom. <laughs> and I took the names from the bottom, and I put them on the third floor, and the third floor I put on the second floor. And oh, somebody, yeah. somebody caught me. And they oh. brought me up to Harry Cohn's office. He said, why did you, why, why did you do that? We don't, we don't need that. Do you know the heart attacks you caused, you know? <laughs> we hire and fire people every two minutes. I mean, you know oh. that I got lawyers, agents calling. Why did you, what? I said, well, I just, for a joke. I did it for a joke. He said, well, how do you like this joke? You're finished. <laughs> <laughs> You're through. And then uh, Guy I was fired. Humor. And then Jerry Wall uh, he went up and he did a lot of pleading and said, please give him a break. He's young, he's bright, he's good, he's Jewish, he's nice, he's short. Right? <laughs> and eventually, so Harry back. Cohen said, all right, all right, uh, uh, clip off a few hundred a week. You know, something, you know. <laughs> but he kept me there. You're a legend yourself. We have I a message. We'll own. be right back. Time. I was just looking through uh, Frank Capra's book, which film buffs are snapping up wherever they can get it. It's called The Name Above the Title, and it's just full of wonderful stuff. The, your first meeting with Harry Cohn, where you decided to get tough with him is the best way to handle him, is, <laughs> is a classic. Um, I, I, can any, could any of you make a film uh, without being completely in control of it? Uh, we all know how Orson Welles feels about that, or, don't we? Well, uh, of course, Orson was, uh, Orson's, a lot of Orson's pictures have been recut. And I know you had Blake Edwards on the air talking about that, about recutting re and so on. And, and uh, I imagine everybody here, I, I haven't had that awful thing happen, but I, I, I imagine you've had some experience with people fooling around with your pictures. No. You haven't? I oh, caught him, I'd shoot him. Great. But yeah. Orson, Orson did a picture called Magnificent Ambersons, which was uh, totally recut by a kind of group method, you know, like what you were alluding to, I think, at another studio, and, uh, and what Edwards was talking about. And it was all because of two disastrous previews that they had. And this picture, it was not the kind of picture that was, you know, it wasn't a, a, an average sort of movie. And they had two average sort of previews in Pomona and Pasadena, and they were played with a, with a Dorothy Lemour movie, and the audience just hated it. And so it was totally recut and jumbled and botched and of course it's still a great picture but i think a great great story in connection what we're talking about about one man running a studio is with zanuck had a similar thing happen when they previewed i think it was the grapes of wrath and it had a terrible preview and uh you know hissing and bad cards and everything and they all got back to the studio and they said daryl what, what are we going to do you know it's just and he thought for a minute, and he said, we're going to ship the picture. I think it's good. And that was it. You know, now that's one man making a decision. He could see a good picture. He just thought it was a good picture, and the hell with it, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I think those previews, uh, we got kind of wiped out on, on Brewster McCloud because Will Will you watch of, the boom shadows on uh, Mr. Altman, please? <laughs> <laughs> But uh, on, on Brewster McLeod, yeah, we, preview? no, we took it to Denver and uh, we had a, a great preview. We had much better preview than we did on, in, for Mash. And only at the end of the picture, nobody walked out of the of the theater laughing because it wasn't a very funny ending. <clears throat> I thought it was fantastic, and all these guys from MGM were, were disappointed. And it took me about six weeks later to realize that they didn't even watch the film; mm -hmm. they just. They saw the people coming out, they weren't laughing. I was a guy that did MASH, it's supposed to be funny, the picture can't be any good. Uh, ship it, and they shipped yeah. it. But they didn't, they I've never had anybody well, own it. Yeah. Did anybody I, ever try I, to I, take serious, a film from you, Mr. Kepler? And, I always and, know where the key no, is. No, <laughs> nobody ever tried to take a film from me and, and, yeah. and cut it. No, I would just do it aloud. I just, uh, you just laid that down from the beginning. Yes. Well, this is very rare. I think that if you don't lay it down, then I think it's up to you, younger fellas right now, Hollywood is, it's dying is because you, ha you haven't got control of your own films yet. Mm -hmm. Now you have to find a way to get control of your films away from the, from, from those who consider film as some leisure, leisure time investment and uh, just an art in a conglomerate of some kind. Yeah. And uh, you, it's got to come back into the hands of the creative people. And until it does, you're going to have these mishmash, you're going to have people who don't give a damn whether Hollywood makes it or not, you see. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I, I got a story about a, pre a preview, a bad preview, if you want to hear one. I mean, Would you sure. tell it? Let's my, take a my break. Own. We'll my take own. a break so we have time <clears throat> for it, and then we'll come right back. Good. 
Mr. Capper, you were going to tell us about something that happened to you with a preview. Yes, I had a very disastrous preview at the time of one of my most important films, and the pic that picture was Lost Her Eyes. Yeah. We ran that picture in the projection room the first time we put it together, and uh, invited all the people from the studio, all the Lancemont and everything else. We were piled three deep in that projection room, and we ran it, and it was three and a half hours, the picture. And uh, we thought, this, this has got to be the world's greatest picture. Everybody just that was completely uh, uh, exalt, you know, way up on cloud nine. Yeah. So Harry Cohen sent for these, the, his New York executives and said, come on out, you so-and-sos, I've got a, something great. But he was just smart enough, this was Cohen, he was just smart enough that we probably should once try it in the theater before we, before we really blew our tops about it. You with see, a real audience. Yeah. So he said, let's take it out for a sneak preview. So we took it to Santa Barbara. He says, if we can knock off those Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara snobs, we got it made. You see? So we up, we up to Santa Barbara, he and his wife, and uh, my wife and I, and uh, that's all. Rainy, and we put the picture in major preview, nobody knew what was coming up, but uh, the picture started. And it's gone about five minutes, and the, the audience begins to laugh. Well, they shouldn't, there were no laughs. Uh, mm. Then they began to laugh a little bit more, a little bit more, and finally they're, they're laughing at everything that's happening on the screen. Well, I'm, I'm died, I've died. I get up out of the chair, go on out in the lobby for a drink of water, completely nonplussed. I didn't know what, I was in a state of shock. Oh. I lean down to get a drink of water, and another man comes out, and, and this is then drinking this water, he says, did you ever see such a star thing with that, that Fu Manchu thing they're showing? And I, oh, I, I just, <laughs> I just rushed out of the theater, <laughs> and there was a big clock out, outside this theater, mm -hmm. big four-sided clock, and uh, just, just 10 minutes there, there, and the picture had it three hours and a quarter set to go yet, and I walked <laughs> up and down in this rain, and, uh, oh. and I, I went into a drugstore to get a Coke, and my hair was wild, and my eye was wild, and I'd get a Coke, and I'd come back in, and the band, man began to worry, you know, I, I looked like a, a drug fiend, something, you know. Yeah. So I was waiting for this, to, to come out. Well, three hours walking up and down that rain, and they, th then they started coming out. And as you start coming out, you can hear them talking. Oh, what, did you ever, did you ever see, what a terrible thing. Did you ever see anything like that in my life? They should be shot, whoever made that picture. This is, you can hear these. I ran to the car. This is Lost Horizon? Lost, yeah. lost Horizon. Yeah. And my wife and I, and Harry Conner, his wife, and we get in the car, and we drive home, and everything is very very dead, of course. Yeah. And this was Harry Cohen. This is what, this is what he was. He said the, th the right thing at the right time. He said to me, Frank, I still give you that seven-year contract. Well, nothing, you, could, you couldn't beat that for, for, for a little, you know, yeah. uh, uh, enthusiastic uh, yeah. bar, it's encouragement. Yeah. So I went off to the hills. I went off to the uh, Big Bear. And I started walking around the hills trying to figure out what, what, what had happened to our beautiful, beautiful lost horizon, but they laughed at it. And I, after two days up there walking around by myself, I came back to the studio and said, Harry, let's preview the picture again tonight. He said, well, no change, I said, I've made one change. I've put the main title on the beginning of the third reel. And let's preview it again. That's all I, that's the only thing I could think about. I mean, there was no, Printing it all at the beginning, just no. I just put the main title, yeah. the beginning of the, the third reel. I just took the first reel, two, first two reels out. Oh, I see, and started yes, the movie moved, farther that's in. The only I see. change. Yeah. And he said, "But we can't afford it." I said, "This is it. If if it does go this way, I don't know what. We we, we just got a complete bomb. That's all." And so we took it down to, uh, to uh, Wilmington, and it, it goes on the screen, and this and there is the picture that finally went out. Totally different picture. They didn't laugh, they didn't do anything. They were completely enthralled. It was a different show entirely. But do you still know why? How do you explain that? Well, I, but, but of course, we came back, you know, on cloud nine. Now we're really on cloud nine. I, we came back and I went right back to the cutting room and took those two, two reels right in my hot little hands and went down the incinerator and they were, nitrate, <laughs> they were nitrate filled and I threw them right into the incinerator and went, woof, Hollywood. <laughs> 
It lit up the it's Hollywood night sky all over the place. That much sure. nitrate would blow Columbia off the map. Well, anyway. it really blew, blew but I, it did. Uh, so there's no record of those. Now, wouldn't you, you sort of wish now you had them to see what was so. I can't remember what was in them. You were that glad to get rid of them. <laughs> yes. I wonder how you knew oh. the, where, why those were the things that were wrong. I don't know. They, those, these are decisions you make. That's Something all. just told you. How did you know not to take out reels two and three instead of one and two? I, I don't know what would happen if I had a nice picture. Would probably been better. <laughs> That's a great story. It's a story about instinct. Yeah. So uh, whenever you yeah. got a picture that isn't going, burn the first two reels. <laughs> <laughs> Remember we, just, we just solved the problem. Yeah. <laughs> See, you learned something. We'll be right back after this message. The show before it was out. We're back. You know? we and, you know, what? can you imagine what happened when they saw that? Who? I mean, it hadn't been validated yet by the critics or by, you know. The Hadassah saw the producers? And yeah, the I mean, you know, and they saw a lot of Germans, a lot of Nazis <laughs> jumping around. They said, what yeah. kind of picture is this? We expected a 2,000-year-old man, you know, nice little chicken soup, something. You know? yeah. <laughs> they saw awful. the entire German army coming at them, you know. Yeah. They really didn't get it. I guess not. Well, there's I a great not. story about Buster Keaton, who, who was uh, uh, religiously previewed all his comedies, you know, and took a picture out, I think it was called Seven Chances. And it was a wonderful reaction to the picture, and it didn't have a good ending. It just sort of lay there at the end, you know. It was a great chase with 7,000 women chasing him, because they were all brides, a wonderful scene. And they all, literally 7,000 women, all chasing him. And... Uh, uh, the, the, it sort of petered out, and that was it, you know? And the audience said, and he felt something was wrong. But what, right toward the end of the scene, he's running away from these women, and he's running down a hill, and three, and as he was running, three rocks just got dislodged and rolled after him. It was a big laugh from the audience, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And he said, we're going to shoot a new ending. And he went back, and he shot for about a week, and he took those three rocks, and he, and he built an avalanche. He started with three rocks, and he built it to bigger rocks, and finally these huge boulders, you know, the size of those cameras, you know, yeah. rolling down after him. Well, it's one of the great sequences ever done, you know. It's just a hysterically funny, surrealistic sequence and breathtaking, and all because he uh, got a little laugh with three little pebbles, you know. Why, why did Keaton hit the skids? Uh, that's one of, seems to be one of the sad mysteries of Hollywood. Since well, he, he was all a, that essentially a pantomime, pantomime artist. Yeah. And uh, uh, when sound came along, that they, uh, the, uh, the, pa the pantomime artists went out of business, really. And also, they were killed by, by uh, something brand new, cartoons. That's right. Cartoons could do a lot of things they were cartoons doing Cartoons could do, could, could do uh, uh, and the That's cartoon true. became cheaper. And now, now we're making films that imitate the cartoons. Cartoon. And then we just got I just, did a, I just yeah. did a picture called What's Up, Doc, which is, uh, there's a chase in it that is absolutely Buster Keaton. Yeah. Chase, you know, I mean, just stolen, lifted. Is it funny, and, though, and with modern car cars? Well, we don't use cars all the way through it. We use oh. something else for a while. But yeah. uh, uh, it's use? true. Tell us, what are you A using? grocery cart. Grocery cart. Yeah. Sorry, yes, but I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, but Chuck Jones, who did all the great Bugs Bunny cartoons, mm -hmm. told me that it's funny you mention that because he he directed most of the great Bugs Bunny Roadrunner cartoons, and he said he was totally influenced by Buster Keaton. He said everything he did in the That's cartoons right. was taken from Keaton. That's right. And, uh, they they uh, they just dropped they just dropped out of business, and I and and uh, I came along with it half one night, really, the what thing you saw there, and. Uh, tried something, uh, tried to combine the leading man and the comedian in one, rather than the... Uh, comic relief. Comic mm -hmm. relief. See? That's right, there were always two people before. The, 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 the classic four in, uh, in uh, drama was hero, heroine, uh, villain, mm -hmm. comedian. And uh, Gabby Hayes running off with his pants That's on right. fire. Yeah, yeah. Gabby Hayes was a comedian. <laughs> so <coughs> I combined the leading man and the comedian, comedian in one and got mm -hmm. a very, a very uh, uh, you know, Mr. Deeds and those kind of pictures. That was the first time it was done. It, it happened when I was really the first time it was done. It's strange to think that somebody had to invent that, but it's really a... Right. Well, so the see, leading I mean, man was doing the Pratt Falls as well. Right. The leading band was getting the laughs, you see. To combine the comedian and the leading man was a very felicitous uh, combination. You knew Max Sennett and that whole group of people who saw what it was like to invent yes, those gags and things. And that, who was the man you said you envied so much who could think of gags so quickly for Laurel and Hardy? Leo McCary. Leo McCary, yes. Oh, yeah. Leo yeah. McCary. He was, uh, he made the most wonderful Laurel and Hardy films. Which we, uh, I want to tell you something else about our particular medium, because I want to tell you that, that how wonderful this medium of ours is and how different it is from the stage and, and how it is a director's medium primarily. 
I, I have made three, three uh, Pulitzer Prize plays into pictures. Uh, Arsenic and Old Lace, uh, State of the Union, and You Can't Take It With You. And they were all had to do with Lindsay and Krauss. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I was, and I, I had to change them all. And I made some big changes in these films, to make, in, these pictures, in these plays to make a film out of them. Yeah. And that took a little guts to do because these were Pulitzer Prize plays. You don't fool around when I think it's very good. They must have hated that, didn't they? No, they didn't because it turned out all right. But now I want to tell you, I, had some, I was making some changes in the State of the Union that I, I, I was a little worried about. And Lindsay and Krauss were in Hollywood at the time, so I called Lindsay and I asked him to have lunch and I wanted him to tell him these changes. Mm -hmm. And he says, I don't want to hear anything about any changes. I don't want to hear anything about anything. I said, what's the matter with you? You know, he's very down. He says, well, he says, Life with Father played 10 years on Broadway. We wore out three sets of kids. Everybody played it. I played it. Everybody played it. No matter who played it, it was a hit. And we sold it to Warner Brothers, and we, we, were, we were afraid of any changes. We shouldn't make any changes because we didn't know what made this play good, you know. We, mm -hmm. so. We had in the contract that we had to supervise every scene, every cut, every line. So they were on the set all the time. They, the curls were the same as the curls on the kids on the stage. The <laughs> shoes, the button shoes, everything. The signs on the wall of the little house. Everything was exactly the same because they were afraid to touch anything. And he says, last night we previewed this Life with Father. I remember this has been a, this is the biggest stage hit ever, ever but on. I tried to buy that thing many, many times. And he says, the, the audience walked out in the middle of it, and we have nothing, a complete flop. And it's exactly the stage play. Yeah. Now, this I just couldn't believe, but it happens. So we have a different medium. They you, filmed the play to be safe, and they it bombed. They filmed the play yeah. to be absolutely safe, and they bombed. How do you explain Did you suggest taking out the first two reels? Or? Oh, I, I was, uh, that is, I, I couldn't explain it. I don't know. I, all, all I know is we got a different medium. Yeah. You yeah. mentioned Leo McCary, who, uh, who, uh, I, who died a year or so ago. I, I interviewed him in, in the hospital, actually. Mm -hmm. And he uh, told me a wonderful, I don't know if we have time, but he told me a wonderful story about Laurel and Hardy. Can you tell it in a minute and a half? Try. Okay. Uh, you know, a lot of the Laurel and Hardy gags were based on uh, thorough destruction, beginning small and building to epic proportions, mm -hmm. you know, starting with cars or whatever. And, <clears throat> He, I asked him how he got the idea for that, where it all started. He said he was in New York, it was in the 20s, he was in New York with Charlie Chase and a bunch of people, and they were all going to go to a party, and he didn't know how to tie a bow tie. So he asked Mabel Norman, he says, would you tie my bow tie? She says, no, let's, she says, let's leave him. And they left him without the tie being tied. And so he sat there, and he couldn't think how to tie the bow tie, and he called up a friend of his in Hollywood. He says, do you know, I, got, I don't know how to tie a bow tie. <laughs> and uh, it was a photographer, and the photographer says, well, you're in luck, because my wife is doing a show in New York, and she knows how to tie a bow tie. Now, I'll call her, and she'll come over and tie your tie for you. So he, she, sure enough, she comes, to the, I'm shortening it, she comes over mm -hmm. to the hotel, and she ties the tie for him. And he's very happy, he goes to the nightclub, you know, and sits yeah. down, he sits down, and they all say, hi, Leo, hi, Leo. And he tells the story, what happened. Well, you see, I went, and he tells the whole story, and as he finishes, Mabel Norman leans over and pulls his tar. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he, everybody laughs, Hal Roach laughs, and he leans over and pulls Hal Roach's tie. Hal Roach leans over and pulls Charlie Chase's tie. And then the guy leans over on the next table, and they do it the whole yes. nightclub. Everybody started pulling ties. <laughs> and when they ran out of ties, they started ripping the tuxedo jackets up the back. <laughs> and he says, after about you know, 10 or 15 minutes, the whole place was a shambles, and that was the basis for 10 or 12 Laurel and Hardy pictures. Oh, that's right. wonderful. Sure. Let's start right now. <laughs> we have a message. We'll be right back. Thanks, gentlemen. I wish we had more time. Frank Capra's book is called The Name Above the Title, and you will want to read that. Good night. <laughs>